Kia ora everybody, welcome to the webinar. I'm Francesca from Charity Services and today we have Robert Clark from MB presenting about the re-registration process under the New Incorporated Societies Act. Last week, Robert discussed what was changing in the Act. If you missed that webinar, you can search webinars on our website and you can watch it. It'll be up on the website this afternoon. We're aware that lots of people are unsure if they are an incorporated society. And last week, we had many people who joined the webinar whose charities were charitable trusts. So the changes we are talking about today only affect incorporated societies. You can check on the incorporated societies register to see if you're an incorporated society. We'll post a link now in the chat. Please use it if you are unsure what structure your charity is. So if you're a charitable trust, you don't need to attend this webinar. So Robert has been involved in updating the legislation and is an expert on what the changes involve. I'm going to talk about logistics in the next slide, and then we're going to have a look at Robert's presentation. Welcome, Robert. Thank you for taking the time to join us today and share your knowledge about the re-registration process. Thank you. So before we start the webinar, we're going to just cover off some logistics. Can you hear us? Make sure your computer sound is unmuted. If your sound is cutting out, check your internet connection. Turn it off and on and see if that helps. So this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording via email. Please feel free, free to share it with your committee. Any links or resources that we talk about during the webinar will also be sent to you by email. This is a listen only webinar, but we welcome your questions. To ask a question, type in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And finally, in the event that we lose internet connection, we will contact you with further information. Technology can sometimes be unpredictable, so please bear with us. All right, I'll hand over to Robert now and we'll listen to his presentation. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Francesca. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, many of you will have attended last week's presentation and just want to recap that last week's presentation assumed that you would re-register under the, incorporate, the new Un Incorporated Societies Act. Um, you're not obliged to, um, but if you don't, um, there'll be consequences, which I'll talk about at the end of this presentation. Last week, we also explained what your obligations would be under the new Incorporated Societies Act. Uh, and you can watch um, that webinar on the Charity Services website. But um, before moving on, I'd like to correct uh, something I said last week, uh, and this will be welcome news to many of you. Uh, if you are an incorporated society that is a registered charity, you won't need to send an additional annual return to the company's office. You will continue to send just one annual return and that will be to charity services. So I apologize for, for um, misspeaking last week on that issue. Uh, next slide, please, Jordan. So this week's presentation, this is about the re-registration process, which will be available uh, to you between early October next year and uh, up until very early April 2026. It's about two and a half year period. Uh, and it's aimed at helping you decide whether you will re-register and if so, when you might do that. Next slide, please, Jordan. Thank you. This is an extract here from the website of, of uh, the company's office. Uh, and it just shows you uh, in a good graphic format, the timeline. In April 2022, you'll see on the left hand side, the new Incorporated Societies Act was passed. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's come into force yet. Um, between May 2022 and September 2023, people like me are very busy preparing regulations 
that will be made under that Act and which are necessary to make sure the Act functions as intended. Those will be minor, rather dull details like what sort of information somebody needs to provide when, for example, they apply for re-registration, uh, any uh, in the level of any uh, fines that might be payable if a society uh, fails to uh, comply with its obligations and those sorts of things. We'll be putting out a discussion document on those regulations uh, in, in a month or so, and uh, I'll make sure that I provide uh, the details of that to charity services so that if you'd like to comment on what those regulations should be and what they should say, uh, you'll be able to do so. We'll try to get those regulations in place by September next year so that in October, when the new Act comes fully into force, uh, you're able to re-register and you'll know what's required of you when you re-register in terms of the, the, the details, for example, the information you'll need to provide. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Jordan. What you're going to need um, when you re-register uh, is an updated constitution. Now, it's possible that your constitution is already compliant with the new rules. If you're a, um, a society which has really gold-plated your constitution in the past, but uh, even if you think that's the case, uh, it's important to double check because your constitution, when you re-register, will need to be uploaded and it will, will be checked. And the sorts of things you might not have in it uh, include uh, dispute resolution rules. What happens when there's a, dis a dispute between members? Uh, those dispute res resolution rules will have to be uh, of a, a standard that we call um, natural justice standard. Basically, that means that you'll need to ensure that the person complaining has a right to be heard, that the um, person complained about has a right to be heard, and that the people making the decision don't have conflicts of interest. Uh, your uh, constitution will also need a suitable wind-up clause. Uh, the uh, Charities, um, if you're a charity and you've been accepted as a charity, you'll you'll probably have a gold-plated wind-up clause that um, that says when you've been wound up and all your debts have been paid, uh, anything left over needs to go to another charity. If that's the case, then you'll you'll be fine in terms of re-registering with the company's office as an incorporated society. Um, you're also going to need at least ten members, which is down from the minimum of fifteen in the past. Um, if you're a, uh, a charity whose members are actually not individuals, but for example, uh, legal persons like regional uh, incorporated societies, uh, then each member will count for three. So you'll actually only need four members uh, to re-register if those members are uh, are not individuals, but legal persons. Now, MB already has an online constitution builder, which you can use to help um, uh, prepare a fresh constitution if you want to, or to steal ideas for incorporating into your current constitution. Uh, and that online constitution builder, it'll be, it will be updated before the re-registration process starts next October and it'll contain all the required clauses. Um, as I said, if you're a registered charity, then it's advisable probably to keep the same wind-up clause that you had when you were registered with charity services, um, if that's already been approved with them. Uh, next slide, please. So, what will the re-registration process involve? 
you'll need to use the company's office uh, website to re-register. Uh, somebody in your society will be familiar with that website. They will have had to use it to create your society in the first place uh, and to update the company's office about um, major changes, for example, to your constitution. Um, now, if you're a um, society that is not too keen on uh, the online world, and I don't think there'll be many of you attending a webinar, but exceptions will be able to be made on a case-by-case -case basis um, if it's simpler for everyone for that re-registration to be done in a paper format. But assuming you are uh, using the website, you'll need to fill in a form. You'll need to type in things like the society's name, um, the officer's names and details of the society, uh, and the registered address of the society. Uh, and as I mentioned before, a few extra details that we're going to uh, prescribe in regulations. You'll then need to upload uh, your proposed constitution through the website. I would double check that you have those dispute resolution rules. Um, if you're a charity, you probably already have uh, met the requirement to have a not-for-profit beneficiary um, when you're wound up and your surplus assets are distributed. You'd then await uh, confirmation from the company's office that you've been re-registered. Uh, we don't expect that to be very long, uh, matter of hours, perhaps a day or two. Uh, the question you may be wanting to know is whether there'll be a re-registration fee. Uh, I could probably suggest that it's unlikely. Uh, but uh, this is one of the issues that will be discussed in the discussion document on regulations, uh, which will come out perhaps in a month's time. So perhaps another reason for you to have your say during that consultation. Next slide, please. So your application is going to need uh, to name at least 10 members or four, um, at least four if they are legal persons and not individuals. Uh, you're going to have to have a society name that's acceptable. Now, if you've already, um, if you're not changing your name, uh, then uh, that shouldn't be a problem unless uh, social uh, mores have changed uh, significantly. Uh, but um, to be acceptable, uh, your name needs to have incorporated in it or ink um, or um, the Tadeo version, which is mana topu. Um, that's what it needs to include. And what it can't include is um, anything that would make it misleading um, in terms of what your actual purpose is, uh, anything that might be offensive. Um, those are very unlikely scenarios, but one that is perhaps a little more likely is uh, your name can't be almost identical to the name of another incorporated society or company. Uh, we've had occasions where, uh, I think I mentioned this last week uh, in the Sikh community that uh, there were many, many names proposed uh, for societies in the Sikh community, which were some of which were deemed too similar to us. It can't be for making money for the members, but for you uh, as registered charities, uh, these are really just almost certainly matters of um, abstract interest rather than any practical concerns that uh, you won't be re-registered. Of more interest to you is that your, const your constitution will need to meet the requirements of the Act. And as I've said before, that means it should include dispute resolution clauses uh, and the like. Next slide, please.
So I alluded to this earlier. What happens if your application to re-register is rejected or you choose not to re-register? Now, rejected, you will, of course, um, continue to have a, a chance to uh, apply again until April 2026, um, at which point, if your application is still being rejected, uh, the following consequences will occur. But you may also decide not to re-register. You may think, oh, all these new requirements, um, perhaps we should uh, change our form to a different uh, type of legal entity. Uh, or perhaps you may just decide uh, to no longer continue as a, as a society at all. Uh, your society will cease to exist. So it's just like if a person dies. Um, all the debts of the society will need to be paid. Uh, that might include uh, money to utilities, uh, any uh, overdraft with the bank, uh, and anything that's left over, um, what we call surplus assets, would, will need to be distributed as per your constitution. So I just want to make clear that if you if you don't re successfully re-register by April 2026, you won't be able to carry on as a legal entity as before. The members of the society don't have um, the right to claim the property. Uh, they won't, if they try to continue their, their activities, they won't benefit from having a society that can sign contracts for them, for example, for uh, the lease of a clubhouse, one of the members of the society will need to put their own name on it. And that means that they will become uh, at risk of personal liability if things go wrong and uh, creditors can chase them personally. Next slide, please. So the uh, period for re-registration, I'll stress it again, is October, from October 2023 to early April 2026. I recommend you try to re-register as early as possible. And that's because there are 24,000 incorporated societies that will be at least considering re-registering. And if you re-register earlier, earlier then if your first attempt to re-register is rejected perhaps because you haven't included dispute resolution clauses in your constitution um, you'll have plenty of time to try again um, it would also help avoid a rush near the end of the uh, re-registration period which could be stressful for you but also for the processing team at the company's office I've mentioned this during today's webinar. I've said spring 2022. I, I, I've been more precise today and said in, a, in about a month, we will have a consultation on the regulations. Uh, if you'd like to proactively get yourself on a list uh, so that you're informed when that consultation goes live, you can write to engage at societies.govt.nz. That's a team within the company's office. And they'll make sure that you're, you're told when uh, the consultation goes live. And they'll also uh, be able to put you on a, a news list to let you know when uh, things like other webinars are, are happening. Francesca. Um, I think this might be your slide. It is. Thank you, Robert. So, sorry, I'll just get my screen together so I can see. Um, when does it come into force? So, as Robert said, the Act's going to come into force in stages. So, there's no rush to do anything now. Uh, the final date for re-registration, as you've heard, will be uh, in 2026. So, you have some time, so don't panic, everybody. Every incorporated society will need to rewrite their constitutions to add in the additional requirements of the new Act. 
and um, Robert has said that the um, constitution builder that MB have, it's an online constitution builder, it will be filled um, and adapted so it fits the requirements of the new act, so you'll be able to use that. Um, Charity Services and MB are committed to providing you information as you need it. We've already discussed putting some um, additional headings in our newsletter to make sure we write something about the Incorporated Societies Act changes every couple of months. So if you're not signed up to our newsletter, um, sign up today on our um, homepage and then you can keep up to date. And as Robert said on their um, page too, there's some um, a place where you can sign up. And when we send out the resources, um, we'll send you a link to that. So you um, will get informa information directly from MB. And lastly, if you missed it, um, incorporated societies that are registered charities, there is no change to your reporting requirements at the moment. So you can continue to use the, um, the reporting standards that you use. The, um, so you'll be tier one, two, three, or four, probably three or four for most of you. Um, so there's no change for those. Next slide, please, Jordan. So now we have time for your questions. Thank you very much, Robert, for your presentation. And if you just want to put your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the screen, if you attended last week, we've answered um, all the questions. We got 38 last week and we've answered those and they'll be sent out to everybody that um, registered for both of the webinars. So the first question is one from Robert. Um, when will the regulations and orders in council be promulgated and what will they cover? So the regulations are being prepared and I would say they will be promulgated in, dra uh, in draft form for people to comment on um, in around April next year. Um, that will be a consultation with an actual version of the regulation saying, um, thanks for your submissions back in, say, August this year. We've taken those into account and we've prepared these draft regulations. Do you think this reflects the feedback that you gave us? So you'll get a, a view of the regulations, what they're going to look like around April next year, but they won't actually be promulgated um, until about August, September next year. We have to have them uh, in place before that October uh, 2023 date. Um, that's what the Act says. What, what they'll cover is uh, mostly pretty, pretty uh, fin fin uh, mundane details, I'd say. Uh, there'll be things like what, what precisely um, what bits of information precisely will you have to provide when you re-register? Um, slightly more interesting, will there be a re-registration fee um, to cover the cost of processing those re-registrations? Uh, what will the fines be if, some, if a society uh, breaches one of its obligations, for example, fails to uh, send in its annual financial report. Uh, all sorts of things like that. There'll be a couple of grittier issues, um, some of which will concern incorporated societies that are not registered charities, so hopefully not too many people on this call, uh, such as uh, which of those societies need to get their financial reports audited. Now you have already settled that question in your Charities Act law for you, uh, but this, the issue hasn't been settled for the other incorporated societies that are not registered charities. So um, that's, that's just an idea of what you'll see in the regulations. Um, and uh, there'll be a, a much better description in our discussion document, which will come out in about a month. Just further on um, from that question, so it's a follow-up question from Mark who asked that question. He said, according to the 2022 Act, the final transition date 
is 1st of December 2025. And he's saying that um, we're saying 2026. Is there's a bit of a disconnect? Can you explain that, Robert? Sure. So uh, I'll just go to the clause in question. Um, I think it's an either or uh, commencement. Uh, 2025. Let me see. So the the main uh, the main commencement uh, provision is is section two, which says that the ability to make regulations came into force when the act was passed back in April, but uh, the rest of the act comes into a force uh, on a date um, either to be chosen by the governor general, um, which is not uh, going to happen or um, uh, in stages. One is 18 months after the uh, legislation comes into force, which is uh, October next year. And that's when the provisions on re-registration come into force. But the 2025 uh, provision, I'll just look through it, is an either or. So that's in the schedule. Um, it says that your society will continue to be subject to the old act um, until it re-registers or if it doesn't re-register until uh, one of the following, the later of the following, 1st of December 2025 or a date that's two years and six months after that re-registration period has started. So that's two years and six months after October 2023 is where we get April 2026 from. So that 1st of December 2025 now um, is uh, no longer uh, applicable. All right, thank you. Um, I'll just answer this question from Tom. So Tom has asked, our society has rules. Does that constitute um, as a constitution? So I would imagine so, um, Tom, but I would check the incorporated societies register or the charities register to make sure that the rules you're talking about are also the rules that have been filed with either the company's office or charity services. Um, oh, my questions are jumping all over the place. So here's a question um, for Robert. When re-registering, re I'm assuming we can use our current name what would happen if some other organization takes our name before we re-register? Uh, that uh, should not be possible because that um, the people who will be checking the, uh, the names of uh, societies that are re-registering uh, will be checking them against uh, all existing entities, whether you exist under the 1908 Incorporated Societies Act or under, um, for example, the Companies Act. So rest assured that uh, that won't happen. And if it did, for some reason, there would be a recourse available to, to undo the damage. Great. Um, Margaret, I'm going to answer your question just quickly. Um, the updated Constitution Builder will be not available this coming October. It will be available by October 2023 when you need to start re-registering. So, and maybe even a bit before that. But we will let you know, or MB will let you know if you sign up for um, the updates. Um, there's another question for you, Robert, from Christine. Um, she wants to set up an incorporated society. She has a constitution. Should she be registering this new incorporated society under the new act or the old act? Uh, so at the moment, um, her only option is if she wishes it to be an incorporated society is to register it under the old act. Um, it will be possible to register uh, only um, under the new act if she waits until October next year. So there's uh, a, some trade-offs there. Uh, do you need legal person, do you need to create a legal entity uh, before October next year? Uh, for example, because you may want to uh, have your entity sign a few contracts, um, uh, open a bank account, that sort of thing. Or can you wait until 
October next year. Um, if you can't wait, you'll have to re register now and then re-register sometime between October 2023 and April 2026. If you can wait, then you'll just have to register once as a new society. Awesome, thank you. And I mean, you can always read the Act and find out what's required. So have a look at MB. If you want to set up something now and want to do the least possible changes, um, there's a lot of information already available. Um, somebody's asked about a branch structure, Robert. If you have a branch structure, does each branch have to have 10 members or more, or only the whole body? Can I take a rain check on that and provide a written response? Because I would like to double check um, with a colleague of mine who, who is uh, more specialised in branches. I wouldn't want to repeat last week's annual return faux pas. Yeah. That's, that's great with us. Um, Gary's asked, um, I assume a change in constitution has to be done at AGM or a special general meeting? That, uh, is, that depends on your constitution. Your constitution should say how changes to your constitution are made. Uh, if it doesn't, um, uh, then... Yes, the safest way to do it is through an annual general meeting or a special general meeting. Um, there are occasions, I understand, on which constitutions provide for committees to make those sorts of decisions, um, but uh, uh, that's pretty rare. So yes, AGM or special general meeting. So have a look to see what your constitution says now and we'll probably have a um, clause to tell you how you can amend it. Um, Jane's question I can answer. So Jane's asked, as the registered charity in an incorporated society, can we simply decide not to re-register as an incorporated society? So that's, yes, you can, Jane. You can be an unincorporated society um, that will have um, some drawbacks depending on what kind of charity you are. So um, unincorporated societies, um, you won't have that protection for um, your members, the legal kind of protection that a legal entity creates. Um, and in the questions that we got last week, we've kind of answered that. So, um, but it is an option. You can be an unincorporated society and a registered charity. Francesca, could I just jump in and say, um, do be careful though, that it won't be a seamless transition. If, if you are an incorporated society now and you decide not to re-register, then your society will need to be wound up and its debts paid. Um, and I'm not an expert on the Charities Act, but um, you'd need to speak with charity services about um, uh, whether or not your charitable status uh, uh, survives that, that event. Um, if it didn't, you'd need to reapply as an unincorporated society. But I am an expert on the charitable. Oh, yeah. But, so um, if you are registered with us already as an incorporated society, your rules will be acceptable and your charitable purposes will have been acceptable to get you registered. So if you, um, um, you don't re-register and you cease to exist as an incorporated society and then you recreate yourselves as an unincorporated society, and yes, that is sounding really messy, your charitable purposes that you had will still work for re-registration as a registered charity. We might need to provide some more information around this. Um, lots more questions. Um, if you have high numbers of members, do you just select 10 or do you have to include all members in the registration? One for you, Robert. Uh, so the question was, um, do you have to include all members or just include 10? Uh, you you would just need to include 10, Great. just just to show that you have the minimum number. Awesome. So Annette's got a question about the changes to financial reporting requirements if not a charity. So if you're not a registered charity, um, Annette, and you are an incorporated society, there will be changes um, and they'll be based on the, um, the reporting standards that charities use. Um, Robert, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, if uh, And just to be clear, this only applies, as you said, to societies that are not registered charities. So that won't necessarily be many of you online right now. But um, 
uh, most of that group will continue to be able to use uh, the reporting that they do at the moment, which is essentially writing on a piece of paper what you've spent, what you've earned, and how much you have in the bank. Uh, however, if you uh, have expenditure each year in excess of about $50,000 um, and you have assets worth more than uh, $50,000, uh, then you're going to need to transition to a slightly uh, stricter way of filing or writing your financial reports. As Francesca said, it will be uh, similar to the financial reports that registered charities use. Um, we estimate that that will only be about uh, 30 or 40 percent of incorporated societies who are not registered as charities. And um, here's another question for you, Robert. If we decide to change from an un, uh, sorry from an incorporated society to a trust, do we still need to go through the wind up process for an incorporated society? Uh, in my opinion, yes. In my opinion, yes too. So you'll need to wind up your incorporated society and then create a charitable trust. And if you're a registered charity, you can talk to us and we have a mechanism to make that a little bit easier. Um, Ruth has a question, if several members leave some time after re-registration, will we need to update with the names of new members? Oh, could you just repeat that please, Francesca? If several members leave some time after re-registration, will we need to update with the names of new members? Uh, you um, you would need to keep the company's office informed of uh, at least ten members. So it it's uh, if if people on that original list leave, um, uh, it's I it would be important to let. Uh, the company's office no um, uh, but I to be honest uh, I think that is only our position at this stage and it, it's something that will be set definitively in the regulations so perhaps another reason to keep an eye out for the discussion document and if you think that that sort of approach is overly bureaucratic then let us know so um, we had a question from our, our friend Patty at CNA and he said, I missed exactly what the consultation is over. Uh, what are, are you consulting about? So could you just elaborate please, um, Robert? Sure, so uh, the, the new Incorporated Societies Act came out in 2020, April 2022 this year, uh, but it, it can't work on its own. It needs to have uh, regulations made uh, to fill in some of the uh, details. Uh, so what we're consulting on uh, in about a, a month's time is a bit of a, a straw man, some ideas about what those regulations uh, should contain. Uh, we're looking for people to provide feedback. For example, there may be a section which says, we think that when you apply for re-registration, you should uh, have to tell us, uh, for example, uh, the residential address of your offices you might want to write back and say, well, we think that's uh, uh, a risk to privacy and we don't think you should uh, include that in your regulations, things like that. Um, once we've got all that feedback from people, um, as I mentioned, we'll prepare a draft version of the regulations that will look quite legal and that will be put out around April next year for, for further feedback. Right. Um, somebody's asked, is there any benefit to employing a constitution lawyer to ensuring that the new revised constitution is compliant if MB, if the constitution builder is compliant with the new act? I'm not quite sure. Um, I can answer that. I mean, you can employ a constitution lawyer if you want to, but I'm sure MB will make sure the constitution builder is compliant with their own act. So um, it's up to you whether you want to spend some money on getting someone to look over your constitution. But um, Robert, what would you would you say to that? Uh, 
it, it's a personal decision, but it's by no means necessary. I think if you, uh, if once the Constitution Builder is updated, um, perhaps by the middle of next year, and it, well in advance of the re-registration period starting in October next year, uh, you should be able to use that to to create your a, a compliant constitution. Um, and uh, even if um, you don't want to use it to complete a complete a, a full constitution, you might find some very useful uh, provisions in there which uh, you can use to meet the requirements of the app. Great. Um, will charity services or the company's office uh, provide a checklist of all the required content that must be in constitutions to allow an easy check and amend the process when we review our constitution? Uh, yes, there will be um, included on the website of uh, the company's office uh, uh, a checklist of things that you should make sure you have in your constitution. Uh, before you upload it in your application for re-registration. Uh, if you write to that address, um, engage at societies.govt.nz, that was uh, on the screen earlier today, uh, you can uh, be put onto uh, a distribution list, um, which will also be direct you to the, to the website of the company's office where all that information will be uh, posted. Excellent. Um, we're out of time for questions, everyone, but we will have a look at the questions that we haven't answered and we will try and provide answers to all of those. I was just going to read out one lovely one, though. Um, so we just got a lovely message from Cathy, who just wants to congratulate us on allowing a considerable amount of time for questions in these webinars. Uh, Cathy says it's the first time that she's attended webinars where more than one or two questions are answered before running out of time. Um, thank you for your comment, Cathy. We have purposely structured these webinars because we know that people have lots of questions and we want to be able to answer them. And um, we're kind of the experts, well, Robert's the expert on um, incorporated societies, and that's why we've done the webinars with a short presentation. But thank you for letting us know that you appreciate it. That's great. Um, for now, thank you, everybody, for coming along today. Um, I'll just have a quick chat about some resources. If you need some further help or you want to look at some of the resources, um, check out the update from the company's office website so you can sign up for that and they'll renew the information from time to time. So it was to having a look back there. Um, our friends Perry Field Lawyers and Christchurch do lots of work for the not-for-profit sector and they've put together a resource hub and it's full of lots of great information about the changes. They've also run some Zoom webinars. I think they're finished now, but you might like to have a look at those too. I attended one and it was brilliant. Um, we've also written a blog about the changes, so you can have a read of that. It covers some of the changes that we've talked about today and last week. We're going to also email you a resource sheet and the answers to some of the questions we've had in this series of webinars. So we all have the same answers. And um, the recording of both webinars will be available for you to watch again on our website. So um, one will be put up um, this afternoon. It's taken us a while to transcribe it. And then um, next week, we will put up the other one. So it comes to the end of the webinar. And I just want to say thank you. Thanks for attending today and for the work you do in your communities. Thanks for all the fantastic questions. It is, um, really good to put your head into finding answers to them um, afterwards. It kept me busy for a little while last week. Uh, we are going to be working closely with MB and we will provide you with more information. Um, so please sign up to the newsletter on our homepage so you receive it. Um, you can also encourage your committee members to sign up so you are not the only person that knows. Um, as I said, the recording of this webinar will be up on our website by next week and the other one from last week will be up this afternoon. Please share it with anyone who think you think needs it. So thank you once again. Um, thanks for joining. Have a great day, everybody. Kakiti anō.